Yeah. So, how do you want to do this? <laughs> um, I I feel okay to kind of just see how it evolves. You had some yeah. points that I thought looked interesting. Yeah. I wonder if um, maybe just doing what we've just been doing, just kind of starting with our own experiences of things so far. Yeah. And then, you know, seeing where that takes us. I think that sounds good. I, I've, one of the things I like about that is it puts us right in the middle of it rather than us yeah. trying to offer some insight that yeah, exactly. comes from some expertise rather than we're in the middle of this like everyone. Yeah, exactly. So do you want to start or do you want me to start? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> the, I have when I I was in Italy um, last November, and I got one of these silly, you know, uh, calendars with a quote on it every day, uh -huh. Italian. And uh, just the other, just was it two days ago? Uh, was, I got one with a, a quote from Seneca. Uh, and it said, um, what therefore is good? And his answer is the acceptance of reality. <laughs> you know, and I thought, wow, <laughs> mm. uh, this is really, really ancient stuff. You know, this is re it really hit home. Um, yeah. And that it, it, it hit home in a personal way, because I think um i think what i find myself going through at different points uh over the last few weeks that i've been in kind of lockdown and going out occasionally very occasion i mean going out i'm lucky to have a garden so i can go into the garden and and do that but going out into the street and doing some shopping and stuff like that what i find is that most of the time I can kind of navigate through that, I guess kind of accepting it. This is the situation I'm in and I can look at it in a way that is, is intrigued by it to some extent. But I also notice that there are various times when it just suddenly hits me in a way that I feel really, I don't want to accept it and I don't like it and I get angry about it. And I also get a bit, I, I get quite scared about it. Uh, you know, um, uh, particularly when I direct it back on myself and I say, well, I'm in that group of people that keeps being highlighted as being in danger for, for age reasons or for medical reasons or whatever. And there's just something that I, I just start, I just go, this is unfair. This isn't right. This, I, I, I don't want this. And then I catch myself saying that and I think, well, what, what are you talking about? You know, unfair, not right. You know, what, what, what is that about? Um, so I think my experiences of going out are when I, I, either the acceptance of the reality of it is really strong and it, in a strange way, it opens me up to looking at things differently. Um, looking at things more intensely, I think, you know, kind of listening to the bird song or noticing people or the silence because there's no planes in the sky. You know, I, I, I notice these things much more powerfully than I guess I did prior to three weeks ago. And then there are these other times where I don't want to notice these things. And I, don't, and I kind of want things to just be as, as I imagine they were. Um, and that sense of loss of freedom really comes over me. And also that sense of fear you know so i start to notice people around me and mm -hmm. uh, and and they scare me you know i don't i you know they they could infect me in some kind of way so that's the main thing people have become dangerous in those yeah. moments. 
Yeah, that's one of my clients spoke about like little kids being weaponized. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it sounds almost like you're, and, and I, I resonate with what you've said in my own way, but that there's um, one level where there's almost like a, you can choose a response. You can choose to be open to it, to be curious, to be interested, even yeah. to be exhilarated at moments by this strange world. And then there's other times when you realize this isn't a choice. Yeah. This is something I've been thrown into and I can't just crawl out of it. I'm stuck here until it changes. Yeah. And then there's fear for me, at least sometimes and claustrophobia. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's a very odd when you talk about sort of seeing the world differently and seeing nature differently. I don't know if nature is different or if I'm just seeing it differently. Um, a lot of people are talking about how nature is coming back. That may be true. Um, but I was thinking about that this morning and I was thinking, I th I, that seems true. The, the, I th maybe it's just I'm noticing because I don't have as many distractions and I see the plants growing and I see the insects coming and I hear the birds. Um, and the rest of the world has receded in terms of noise. But I also this morning was thinking, but that view of nature makes it sound like nature's on the outside. Nature mm. is what's out there and not me. Yeah. And it made me start to think about, but I'm also nature. I'm a part of it all. I don't kind of, in a sense, I don't belong to myself. I belong to nature and it's in me doing its thing in me as well. Yes. And if I am paying it, attention to the environmental nature in a special way, am I also called to pay attention to my own nature mm. in some kind of fresh way? And if you, I mean, if you try that, if you attempt that, what, what happens? Well, I'm noticing a couple of things with that. One is not wanting to wanting to distract myself. I mean, I'm noticing corners of my house that I've never even seen before. <laughs> just the, 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 um, just the ingenuity of distraction is, is mind boggling. Yes. Yeah. So on the one hand, I notice I'm not wanting to wanting to keep things as they were by just kind of holding my breath during all of this and just not really opening up yeah. to it. And on the other that, hand, that a I kind do of security. Sorry, is that a kind of security? It's you know, certainly I'm a denial. Securing myself into this yeah. space that I that I know has always been there. Exactly, isn't changing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's holding on to the familiar in some way. Yeah, and then there is this more un uncanny calling to myself and I don't know what it is mm. I don't know what it's wanting me to open up to and there are times that I sit down and I do purposely tap into it and it's disconcerting yeah. for me yeah and a part of it that I hadn't expected to find was grief how so there's I hadn't been consciously aware of a kind of a grief, but I, a couple of days ago, I started to notice a kind of a grief in my chest. Right. Um, not for any particular person, because nobody I know has died from this or been yes. you know, yes. debilitated by it, yeah. but grieving for almost like lost assumptions or a world I used to know and think it's yeah. never going to be the same. Yeah. You know, grieving for the 70s, <laughs> a world that seemed so, you know, matter of fact and going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. I wonder if that grief is, you know, one of the things that, that I, I'd mentioned to you before we, we had this talk was that sense of how what's broken down to some extent has been the 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 ordinary defenses that we have to 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 escape from let's call it reality 
mm-hmm. you know. And I wonder if if that sense of grief that you're feeling is precisely when you let go of whatever def- ordinary defenses there are, mm-hmm. and you really are willing to confront, you know, this is how things are for me. This yeah. is how I actually experience things. You know, so, the, the, I suppose really being confronted with how we do protect ourselves through, yeah. I guess, the habitual things we do. Absolutely. You know, and for, for various reasons, the habitual things we do have been taken away from us. Uh, even if we're, you know, even if something like shopping is a habitual thing we do, mm-hmm. the way that we have to do it now is no longer part of that habitual stance. We're still doing it, but it's new and we're not used to it. And so we're not protected by it in mm-hmm. as well as we've come, become used to. Yeah. And I, I'm just thinking of it in relation to your sense of wanting your room to remain as it is, mm-hmm. whether that's part of it as well, you know, that sense of uh, this allows me to offset that, those times of grief or those times of openness. Mm-hmm. I can kind of calm myself down into something that okay. feels like it lasts over time. Um, yeah. Because, and let me just say it back to you because uh, I wanted to respond. I think you're saying that. Um, in the pre-world, we had the possibility, this is my way of saying it, of almost anchoring ourselves to kind of floating above what we're really experiencing, feeling what so-called reality is actually going on. We can easily distract ourselves and live in that. Yeah. by and large well underneath something's rumbling but we had all of these different ways of not paying attention yeah. to it. yeah and that in this world what has happened is not just that the world has changed the reality has changed but also our access to it is more unfettered yeah and that that i would say is very unnerving yeah it's not just wonderful although it may have wonderful aspects but it's also very unnerving because what was hidden is now being unconcealed in some yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the only thing I would say is that, that, you know, I think what, what we're, what we're also recognizing is that, that, that free world that we inhabited or claimed to be in, that was illusory as well. It was only free because we'd, we'd constructed various safeguards around it that made it seem as though yeah. we were in that kind of free space. Yeah. And having lost those safeguards, we're confronted with the fact that it never was and probably yeah. never will be. And, and, and so that, that intensity that people feel some of the time, whether positive or negative, um, is, is when they're most in touch with that awareness that the things that they'd cocooned themselves in in the before just weren't available to them. But equally, that desire to somehow return to that safety is also important in the, in the way that maybe we feel safe in certain rooms or as some people have told me, you know, actually, I quite like being locked in, you know, it, it, uh, I don't know if I ever want to <laughs> want to get out again because this feels really safe. I know where I am, who I am, uh, what to do, what not to do. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so there's something about that security mm-hmm. that, in some ways, is as important as the awareness of its illusory aspects. Yeah. That that security or safety is one of the things that people are experiencing. Some are experiencing as positive. Yeah. And I would also add that the so-called freedom beforehand, which was illusory, um, I think some people, having had that 
ripped away so abruptly. Yes. I think some people are looking back and realizing that wasn't, I wasn't free. Yes. I was actually quite constrained by all of those rituals and routines. Yeah. And for that reason, are feeling like I, I, I don't want to go back to that. Yes. Yes. Uh, or, or at least I want to choose what I want to go back to and what I don't want to go back to. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, mixed in with that is the, I suppose, broadly speaking, the, the life threat mm -hmm. that this, whatever, this rupture has, cre uh, has also put forward, you know. So it, it's, it's not only something that's kind of shaken up my, my sense of security and in terms of my everydayness or whatever, it's actually uprooted my sense of security at a very, very basic level. Yeah. Um, not just in terms of my own life, but in terms of the life of others that matter to me and mm -hmm. the life of others in general, in, you know, in terms of, in a, in a world sense. Uh, you know, we keep hearing these figures of, you know, thousands of people dying here, there, and most of the time we just keep them as figures mm -hmm. until for one reason or other, either because we're touched personally by a particular death or um, uh, we have a connection to the, to the space in which these, these figures inhabit, uh, that it suddenly the figures stop being, stop being empty and they have an, an emotional power to them. Yeah. And it's terrifying, you know, it becomes really, uh, not just terrifying because of the death itself, but something about more, more about dying than death. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, and I think again, that points to the sort of maybe the dichotomy between the abstract and the particular yeah. The numbers are just so abstract yeah. and you just see them increasing day after day. And I agree. It's like, it takes something to break through that. Cause I think that is one of the ways that we secure yeah. ourselves is to stay at the abstract and the conceptual. Yeah. For me, one of the things that breaks through it and makes me start to consider it for myself and as a, as a reality that actual human beings are suffering this yeah is to see the bodies being carried out. Yes. And to see these wrapped bodies, that's for some reason is something I can project myself into and think, oh my God, inside that yes. white covering is a human body yeah. that a few hours ago was a living human being. Yeah. And then starting to hear, I mean, they're not only being concerned for everyone, suddenly it seems more real, but then it's also more real for me. Yeah. And thinking, hold on a second. If I start to develop a dry cough and a temperature, yes. what is my response to that going to be? I can't just assume, because now you're hearing about 20 year olds dying and people that were fit and well dying, people in their fifties like me dying. Yeah. I can't assume I'm just gonna come out of this. Yeah. And yet in a sense, although this is an extreme situation, that was always the case it's uncovered something that was always the case, rumbling along underneath all of my assumptions of the world and the order of the world. Yeah. And this has just kind of ripped that open so that every once in a while, at least, I yeah. actually confront. Yes. This could be the end of me. Yes. And that was always true. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I think that sense of this could be the end of me, it, you know, in a, in a way, I I respond to that, or I, f yeah, I, I I kind of yeah, I experience that as I'm being taken out of relation. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer part of that wider relation of things. Yeah, and and it's that that is awful, you know, unacceptable. Um, how can this possibly be? And I think when you see these, the, you know, uh, these bodies encased in, wrapped up or whatever, um, it's almost like, I think, 
what you might be seeing is that sense of these are these things are no longer part mm -hmm. of the life equation. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they've been taken out of it. Yeah. Um, and you know it. I've noticed in the you know in in the news items and listening to people talking on television and so forth how this notion of relation and all being interrelated has come more and more to the foreground. Mm -hmm. um, but it's come, it's come into the foreground in a way that has a kind of negative quality to it or a kind of dark quality to it because it's, it's almost like they're saying it's because of relatedness that we're in this terrible situation. Um, because we can't escape <laughs> the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. We can't cut ourselves off in any complete sense. Therefore, re you know, relatedness is, is kind of dangerous. Um, it has its, you know, we miss it uh, when, when we feel there's not enough of it or whatever, but we te we've tended to only see the positive sense of relatedness and this is bringing it very clear relatedness has its implications that are not always pleasant um, uh, they can be terrifying not only for feeling in relatedness but also from that sense of being ejected from it yeah does that make any sense yeah i mean i think i, I guess I think that does make sense. Um, I hadn't been thinking about relatedness as being one of, as being the way that this is transmitted. Yeah. That relatedness is the avenue of danger. Yeah. Um, which I think is an interesting point. The yeah. thing that I've been noticing was just the poignancy of, um, the way of combating this disease, which is transmitted so easily between people, is to isolate oneself. Yes. And to try to remove relatedness as much as possible. Yeah. And not uh, even to the point of dying. <clears throat> and that, that, I guess, when I, you had started by talking about the, this could happen to me. Yeah. Um, the part of that that does resonate for me is the fact that you could be carried off as a diseased individual that needs to be isolated from the world until you're dead. Yeah. And to go through all of that, actually physically isolated and separated from everyone who used to hold you in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think our attempts to address that has been like this Zoom and all of these kind of. Uh, distance ways of trying to relate but rarely in my experience although I would say my client work I think is an exception to this yeah but usually in these kinds of ways of relating and on Facebook and social media um, it it doesn't it doesn't have what I would have hoped for it doesn't have a kind of a special quality. It doesn't have something new or more profound in it than was there before. Instead, it seems to have, that way of relating seems to have gone on in as kind of a divisive a way as it used to. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and that's disappointing. Yeah. I keep thinking about how, you know, how that, that escape is also expressed in the kind of dehumanizing of <laughs> the numbers, you know, and yeah. not just, just giving numbers and okay, you know, every once in a while, uh, there is a name associated to the numbers and then it becomes human again. Mm -hmm. But most of the time it's kind of dehumanized. And I, I've noticed, you know, just the last few days, there's been this, this discourse going on about, you know, what to do with anybody over 75, you know, so 75 becomes a, a figure 
it stops being persons. It's just an age. Mm -hmm. And it, 75 and over, uh, it, it's to be looked at and treated and understood in a way very different to under 75. Yeah. You know, and, and so again, it, it's like we're only focusing on the age number and eliminating the person. And, and I think that's part of that reaction that we have. Uh, certainly that I, I think I've had at that lower level when walking down the street and looking at people and in a sense not seeing them as people anymore mm -hmm. yeah seeing them as agents of death you know yeah, exactly. kind of way. or or as 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 um susceptible like if i pass an older person i give them a wide berth yeah. <laughs> okay i'll remember that <laughs> <laughs> i don't think you're quite old enough to get that from oh, me well, I, you know i'm getting pretty close to that age group where they're going, oh, you know, you're just a number now. But another thing that adds to that, you're just a number now, is to hear how people understandably, but yeah. horrifically are being triaged. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're a certain age or have some other kind of disability exactly. or condition. Exactly. You, your palliative care is what yeah. you'll get. And again, you know, there probably is is a kind of reality to, you know, does it make sense to put people who are in a very weak state to make them go through further agony of being put on mm -hmm. breathalyzers and so forth? But the way it's expressed isn't expressed from that humane yeah. standpoint. It's being expressed from a kind of almost some bureaucratic cutoff point that says, you know, past this point you're no longer in the relation you know yeah. you're you're outside of it you, you're just you're just something rather than a person yeah exactly as though it's a clinical decision and yeah. and made very clinically yeah, yeah. But, you know the this this the strange coincidence is that you know i've been writing i've been writing this novel over the last 6 months and it's set in 1987, 1988. And it's just reached the point where for various reasons, the whole AIDS crisis, you know, mm -hmm. which is in some ways pretty much at its height around that time, yeah. or really becoming something. And the, the hysteria that's, that started to come to the fore with regard to the fear that people have that somehow the virus is in the air and I could catch it or if somebody's been swimming in a pool yeah. the virus can get to me and all kinds of ultimately absurd ideas dangerous ideas that people had but with that again that kind of dehumanizing aspect that sense of cut off cut off the agents of death, you know, in one form or another. And, uh, and, and so it, it struck me that, in a sense, we've experienced something like this in our lifetimes, maybe not so intensely in that it was so strongly associated with not just, a, not just one, well, in the West, it was associated mainly with, with gay men. But in a wider sense, it was it was associated with people who, for one reason or another, were classified as being not well, uh, uh, Ill, uh, you know, already ill in some fashion or other, and and so forth. But that that same process of dehumanizing, just turning things into numbers and figures, and um, cutting off from, uh, cutting them off from that kind of human relation. De you know, it, 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 the parallels are pretty strong. Yeah, I agree. And why do you think that is, that that is such a strong response, is the dehumanizing rather than the kind of the deepening of, of a human 
Well, I, th I think part of it is what we've been talking about, that if I, if I do that, then I create a kind of safety, a kind of security, you know, the, first of all, in terms of identification, that I am not them, I am not these numbers, I am in the, I am in the safe group, uh, I, I'm in the human category as opposed to dehumanized category. And secondly, I think it, it you know, it's, um, it, it puts the onus of what happens on these other beings, not on me. It, it, it takes a certain responsibility out of my hands. It's not, it's not got anything to do with me. It's got to do with what these pe these ex people are and what they do and what they did and didn't do and all of that stuff and i think in a strange way it, it creates um uh, the at least again the illusion of uh, a a kind of identifiable cocoon as long as i don't associate with these ex beings I i'm fine i'm safe i can yeah. My continuity is safe. My my family's continuity is safe. My friend's continuity is, is safe. Unless, of course, there's a member of my family or there's a friend or whatever who falls into the other category, then I can't quite maintain that illusion so strongly. I think that's very interesting. I, <clears throat> again, the, the question that I have is, and why do we do that? Why do we why is our response to cocoon ourselves? Yeah. Why is the response to close down rather than to open up yeah. to what's actually occurring? And it makes me wonder if one of the lasting or maybe longer term consequences of this strange period of time, once it evolves into something else, whatever yeah. that is, yeah. um, is that we have, not because we chose to, but because we were thrown into it, we've, we've had this kind of, some of those cocooning assumptions ripped open and we're at least in this kind of uh, dual world where, yeah. and it reminds me of um, Heidegger's The Unheimlich, where the unheimlich or the uncanny, where we're in a familiar world that is not familiar. Exactly where we're, we're in something that was supposed to remain hidden enough that we could feel at home yeah. has been exposed. And we live in this uneasy um, openness yeah. to both the wanting to be cocooned, the wanting to retreat, and that something has come like right in our faces so um, starkly. Yeah. That, that neither works anymore. We can't simply open up. It's for some reason, yes. it's too, makes us too vulnerable yeah. or too unstable or too insecure. Yeah. And yet we can't any longer fully retreat. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I don't, my own sense is, is that, uh, that that tension between you know, the wanting the openness and wanting the, illu the whatever, the security is, is inescapable. You know, we, we want both. And in a sense, we require both, I think. If we only stayed with the openness, I, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I don't know how we would, how or if we would survive in, in a kind of social order fashion uh i you know it, it i it, i think <laughs> i think it just would be too overwhelming mm -hmm. that's my sense you know and uh i think of it in terms of you know those people who get classified or labeled as psychotic or schizophrenic i think they they point something to us. There there are people who have unwillingly been confronted with an unbearable openness in their lives, and their response to that is one of abject fear. 
you know, they're, they're terrified by this openness because it, it came upon them. It wasn't something that they'd gone yeah. searching for. It, they, they got hit by it. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we're in the same situation here. We've been hit by something that hasn't been, you know, it's not like we've been trying to meditate on a mountaintop for 20 years to achieve illumination or whatever. It, it's something, in some ways, the experience is, is not so different, I would imagine, in, in, in terms of that sense of opening. But the way we experience the experience is is very different. It, I mean, I think it's very interesting. It, it I think it depends partly what we mean by opening or openness. Yeah. Um, but also, the one thing that I think is different is for someone who has gone mad in some way whatever that means yeah that i think often or almost always is a an individual experience and part of the madness is the difference between that individual and everyone else and i think in this situation one of the things that is so unique is we've all been thrown in at the same time yeah. and maybe that is a qualitative difference that what happens next might be different than just the unbearable openness yeah. that often happens to the individual that maybe as a shared, it's happening to everyone. I think if people are reminded of that, because I think the tendency is to forget that. Yes. Yeah. And to individualize it. If people are constantly reminded, hey, this is, your whole life has collapsed. Your whole business that you've worked towards for 20 years is gone. Yeah. Um, your wonderful lifestyle is now totally unstable. Yeah. But it's the same for your neighbor. Yeah. It's the same for everyone else that you know. Everyone, to some extent, even you know some of the clients I work with, financially are secure. Yes. But only financially, and even in that way, they also think, yeah. "What is secure? Is a bank secure? Is like what? What yeah. is secure anymore?" And the fact that everyone's been thrown into it, maybe that does raise a very unique kind of possibility. Yeah. I think that I agree with you that it raises a possibility. Yeah. My, my sense, however, is, is that the likelihood is, is precisely that kind of mass forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe not even, not necessarily forgetting, but more a, a kind of mass reinterpretation of things. Uh, so we look at it as, well, this is, this happened because X, you know, whatever X may be. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't know enough or we didn't have the right tools or we, you know, th there's some kind of explanation that becomes possible and acceptable and desirable. Um, not for everybody, I agree with you. I think, I think there's going to be uh, always a proportion of people who look at this and go, this has really highlighted something important to me. I, you know, I can't go on, maybe I can't go on living and under the assumptions that I've lived under for X number of years, or maybe I don't want to go on living under those assumptions, yeah. or it's it's liberated me in some kind of way, or uh, mm -hmm. you know all those possibilities. And I think we're picking that up in our, our work with clients as well. You know, uh, I've had several clients say to me, you know, I hate to admit this, but actually, the onset of the virus, I I I've I've never felt so in touch with myself as I do now. Um, and I've realized that so much of my life was spent in terms of things like planning for the future or looking at things in, in a certain way or having a kind of diary or calendar that said, this is what I'm doing today and tomorrow and the next day and so forth. And because of the threat of the virus to all of those things, 
I've put all those things away. I, I, they don't make any sense to me anymore. And I'm, I'm living a much more, in that sense, chaotic life in the sense that I'm open to whatever opens itself in front of me. And I feel great. And I feel awful for feeling great because, uh, uh, because it, it, it's a greatness that's come as a result of this awful situation. Yeah. But it's, it's genuine, you know, they're not, yeah. I don't think they're lying to themselves or to me when they express this. Yeah, um, it's awful because again, we have to really work, I think, to remind ourselves yeah. people are dying. Yeah. Um, but I think that's really interesting it, that some, for some people, this is, this is a retreat. Yes. And through this is a, like a kind of post-corona growth yeah. that might happen, you know, like post-traumatic growth. And also all of this talk of this is a shared trauma, blah, blah. Yeah. Real bullshit. Yeah. For some people, this is not a trauma, partly because they haven't even opened up to the reality yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. And for other people, it, as you say, something is emerging that, is interesting to them yeah. and welcome and yeah. feels almost like this is a this is a very strange way to receive a gift yeah yeah i mean can they can they maintain it or can we maintain it is yeah. is the issue you know and yeah. what what would help us to maintain it I guess it's going back to that sense of stay with the reality of things, you know, stay with what's there for you rather than what you feel ought to be there or once was there uh, or might one day be there again, but just stay with what presents itself. For me, I, I totally agree with that. And I, <clears throat> for me, that's the, pro the practice of focusing. Yeah. Or something like that yeah. is not to be focusing, but where where the intention is to stay with actual moment to moment experiencing, yeah. and to be open to what that how that might inform you. Because yeah. um, I notice in myself, even though I know focusing, <clears throat> I also have this part of myself that insists on projecting me into the future, and a future that looks like the world I knew. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it just insists on, on holding that line, holding yes. on to that yeah. line, even yeah. though I yeah. know how to drop down into my experiencing and my, yeah. my actual current experiencing is very different than that. Yeah. And, and that's the thing again, it's like, you know, that insistence, um, you know, there's an implication in what you're saying that almost uh, that is almost about. I wish I could get rid of it. Um, no, I, I almost the opposite. I wish it would come true quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. my that's my identifying. That's, with okay, it. I, I, but it would change somehow. It would either take over. And and I, I guess what I'm. <laughs> I'm trying to point to is that, you know, there's the tension again, you know, there's the tension between on one hand, you know, these, this, this sense of what happens to me when I, when I focus on what, what is my current lived experience. Yeah. And then when nonetheless, I have these, this insistent position, mm -hmm of looking into an imagined future yeah. um, and I think if we could accept that that we we are we are going to be in that tension that yeah. it's not one or the other it yeah. that that what in a sense what moves us is both Well, for me, I, um, what I find interesting is trying to take a step back from both and trying to open up to both and kind of be curious about both. Yeah. 
the problem for me is when I identify with one and try to hold on to that as the picture of what's going to happen and what I most deeply want. Yeah. I don't want to take sides. I want to be able to step back and just be yeah. curious about both. Yeah. Because I can, as soon as I do that, even imagining doing that, I can yeah. I can imagine other possibilities that have yeah. a little of each in them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I mean, if we're going to talk about things existentially in any kind of way, for me, that's that's the great contribution of existential thought that it, it it's not i think a, i think a lot of people understand it as it directs us to a certain way of living or being or whatever mm -hmm. and i don't see it in that way at all I, I see it as all it's saying to us is you know uh stay with the way of being that that you've adopted own it embrace it uh, challenge it, be curious about it, uh, engage with it. Um, it's not about this is the right way to be and this is the wrong way to be. It's it's trying to break away from that, yeah. and 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 really adopt a position that's that's about ownership of one's experience. Yeah. And I think the paradox is is that the ownership of the experience actually allows you to do something with it to mm -hmm. reconfigure it in some way to find some movement within it that you couldn't see when you were more a victim to it yeah i agree i think that stepping back for me it's it is a phenomenological attitude yeah where you actually want to look at and explore more deeply both from in my case these yeah. two different ways of being yeah and what is in them because yeah. as soon as i do that i realize that the one that yeah. you know, was pulling me to the future that is familiar yeah and it's almost like that's the one that just wants to press play it's yes. like you know it's, i'm i'm, I'm yes. sick of pause just press play put it you know just get back to that i i i know that this is an opportunity for me to not just get back to that uh, but I also know there's something about getting back to that. There's something about that way of being that provided a stability, um, <clears throat> a foundation yes. that also allowed all sorts of other possibilities. Yeah. It wasn't all bad by any means. Yeah. yeah. That sense of foundation is not something to be minimized, you know, yeah. and I think, I think uh, all those evasive, things that we might look at and be critical of about the way people are or respond to things or whatever at the core of them is is that desire for a foundation i think and uh um and it's that we've you know we've we've assumed that foundations are dependent upon certain ways of being yeah. And challenges like what we're facing through the virus are, you know, confronting us with, well, maybe what happens when your assumptions are wrong, that those foundations don't hold? Does that mean there's no foundation? Or does that mean that there are as yet un unnoticed foundations? Yeah. I think I think what happens is for me at least, is, and I would make a claim it's not just for me, but I don't know, yeah. um, <clears throat> is that when those, I would say, misplaced foundations in the external routines and holding all of these distractions in yeah. place, when that starts to break down, I do discover a different kind of foundation that's much more in my own experiencing process. Yeah. It doesn't give me the same stability and predictability, but it it doesn't leave me groundless. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as you say that, I'm thinking of it in terms of the example of doing therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of, the, one of the challenges that all this has brought about is 
can I do therapy under these conditions? And, you know, what's it mean? And all, all those questions. And I think one of the big challenges that this threat is raising focused on therapy is what happens to therapy in the future? Can it maintain that foundation that it has adopted over the last, whatever, 120 years, 150 years? Or uh, because it feels that it's only with those foundations that therapy is possible? Or is it that now those foundations just don't, just don't make that much sense anymore? Yeah. And therapy can continue, but under a different set of novel foundations. So that raises a question for me of how, how do you imagine therapy might go forward for even when this is behind us? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the difficult question. Um, I, I, think, I think one of the things that, that people have been saying is, um, well, their preference for what we're doing right now, you know, the, 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 they actually come about and said, well, actually, I prefer having therapy in this way rather than, you know, me coming over to some, some office somewhere or, you know, uh, time and uh, using time in a different way. Also, if they're honest, you know, they see, you know, uh, they, they see more of the, the therapist. They see what, you know, what's in the background and things like that that seem to be quite important. Yeah. But I suppose what I'm thinking of is also I found that doing therapy online, maybe it's because of my generation or my age or whatever, but I find it much more tiring than face-to-face -face therapy. Yeah. And so one of the points, I suppose, is do we have to keep to the magical 50 minutes or uh, hour or whatever it is? Can therapy be shortened, um, maybe, may, maybe shorter and more frequent, or shorter and even less frequent than it is? Um, or seeing more than one client at a time. Yeah. Exactly. Or do I see? Yeah, exactly. And it, it makes me think back to your, you when you were working at King's. Yeah. And, you know, the tensions that some of the people working there couldn't do it. They just couldn't do the therapy because all the securities that they'd insisted upon yeah. were just impossible. Absolutely. The... the holding on to rigid, rigid frame that needed to be there for them to feel like a therapist. Yeah. And I think the thing that, that working on Skype, when Skype, people started working on Skype, I thought, this is a con, I'm not having any part of it. Yeah. And then I started trying it, I think, initially through supervision or whatever. Yeah. And I realized, actually, it works. And I can get a whole body sense of the person. There's something energetic happening as well. It's not just eye brain kind of yeah. interaction. Um, and <clears throat> it did make me wonder what, what actually is the essence of therapy? Yeah. And I think it comes down to the relationship. I can relate to a person on the screen yeah. as a real person. Yeah. And I, I can still, f I still feel into that person i can still feel what they're telling me and imagine it being real to another being and i think that is the essence of it and the relationship actually can come across through skype yeah yeah so there is that for sure um though i think maybe the difficulty of that may vary from you know i mean we have generations of therapists who i guess have grown up with engaging through mobile phones and, and, and uh, media like this and so forth. And then we have, you know, the pre-millennials who are still kind of going, I'm not so sure about this. Uh, but I agree with you. I think, I think there is, you know, there's um, your, your willingness to be open to the possibilities of this. Mm -hmm 
is crucial, you know, in the same way as we've been talking more generally. It's that, you know, it's my attitude to it that really matters. If I'm convinced this can't be therapy or yeah. this, this is not going to work or this is not acceptable or it's not private enough or uh, whatever, you know, um, then, you know, I'm going to put limitations on it that are bound to have an impact on what's going on. Absolutely. I was thinking also in a broader sense, you know, going back to our earlier discussion around, you know, staying with the experience, you know, staying with the experience that these events have pro has provoked for us. Mm -hmm. uh, as a therapist, you know, so if as a therapist, I really try to stay and in a sense, engage therapeutically from a from a standpoint that I guess is re, remains with the awareness of what this experience is showing to us about mm -hmm. the, the issues of foundations or the issues of the you know the 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 uncertainty of our uh, uh, of our being or the issues around relatedness and so forth. What kind of therapy does that become? You know, the, what, what, are, what are we actually communicating to people or engaging with, with people? I, I wonder if therapy then becomes less symptom focused and symptom mm -hmm. removal focused yeah. and becomes much more, in that sense, conversational. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. And to use an overused term, much more existential. Yeah. And that exactly. it really is about exactly what, what are we as beings? What it, what is it to be human? Yeah. What are we noticing about that? But what are we both noticing about that? And I think part of your question <clears throat> is maybe how how to what extent are we open to it being quite a mutual yeah. exploration? and not pretending that we aren't also in exactly. the midst of this. Exactly. I mean, I certainly have clients who at the beginning, often it's at the beginning or the end of the call, say to me pointedly, how are you? Mm. And, and they're acknowledging that this is a mutual situation. We are all in this. It's, it's strange and unknown for everyone. Yeah. And to what extent as therapists do we pick up on that and open exactly. to it and, exactly. and welcome it? Exactly. You know, it, you're right. It, it is, therapy then becomes something more along the lines of what we talk about when we say we're, this is existential therapy. Mm -hmm. The dilemma is whether what we talk about is what we actually practice. Yeah. You know what what comes out of us in in our engagement with the other, or whether you know what as existential therapists, what we're confronted with is again the the tendency that we've had to secure ourselves into a certain way of uh, a certain framework, a certain set of conditions that have grounded us, but maybe again, as in general, that grounding no longer really sustains yeah. uh, or is sustainable. And so in that sense, uh, uh, you know, a, a new grounding is available to us. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> in that <clears throat> tension that we were talking about between the two different kind of ways of being. Yeah. To what extent are we willing to let go of what has secured us and yeah. kind of open up to what is yeah. um, is our own uncertainty yeah. and practice from that yeah. rather than have that as a cue to grab on to something else. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's an opportunity. There is that opportunity there, you know, uh, again, <laughs> The, the coincidences are, are high, but uh, this novel I, I've been writing, uh, 
one of the characters keeps having it keeps having uh, imaginary discussions with Fre with Freud, and um, and he he's talking about the the AIDS crisis and so forth, and and Freud comes back and reminds him and says, well, you know, I lived through the Spanish flu crisis and my my dearest daughter you know died uh, uh as a result of it um you know she was only 23 she was she was the last child we had she was unexpected she was you know my you know my uh, and i i fell apart as a result of it but in that falling apart i found a way to in a sense, almost to respect her death uh, through looking again at what what I've been saying, what I've been trying to do, and so you know, I uh, this is 1920. He's talking about uh, you know, she, uh, I uh, I recreated my theory. You know, I came out with beyond the pleasure principle. And um, I introduced this idea of, of uh, the death drive, mm -hmm. um, which is really more a repetition drive, you know, kind of forward, backward, forward, backward. And so he, he highlights the fact that as, you know, uh, the awfulness of a situation also brings out incredible unexpected levels of awareness, creative possibilities that are respectful of that situation rather than an avoidance of it or an escape from it. They, uh, they take us forward. I mean, we can disagree as to whether uh, his theories then take us forward or not, but non nonetheless, for, for him, it was like a, an act of moving into, into new possibilities through the acknowledgement of what this situation had generated. So that brings me to what maybe could be the last question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what do you think? Now, this is only, I think, the second week of being locked in our houses. Third for me. Third for you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think second for me. So you're, you're in the future with this. Um, I think it's a process. I think initially it was very odd and strange and people maybe rebelled and didn't comply so much. Then it moved on to actually something positive might come out of this. And I suspect it'll move on to something else and to something else. And it's going to be a whole process of different kind of moods as we yeah. persist in this kind of situation. So given it's your third week, what at the moment, what is your best guess of what lasting shift in human society might come from this? That's really difficult because um, my, my sense is that the tendency will be very great to diminish the power of the experience that we've had and to claim that we we return to the normality that we experienced before. So in, in, in a very broad sense, I, I, I don't have a great deal of, um, I suppose, hope in, in the sense of what what this may change for us um, in a broad sense. I do think that uh, nonetheless, a substantial number of people, maybe not all of us, but a substantial number of people, and I'm not suggesting that I would be one of them, I have no idea, but I think that uh, that some number of people will not allow themselves to 
pretend that the the world has just gone back to the way it was and so forth. And so I think that um, in that sense, there will I I suspect there'll be possibly quite a a flowering of creativity. I think perhaps initially in the arts, uh, in our ways of thinking, um, at a more everyday level, I suspect that it will change the way we understand uh, um, the kinds of relations that we have, how we relate, mm -hmm. what we relate to, maybe the way that we, undoubtedly I think the way we work, a lot of us work will change. Uh, I think a lot of people are finding working at home something that gives them satisfaction. Certainly a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the larger organizations are seeing the, uh, the benefits from their standpoint. People work harder and longer when they're working at home. So not necessarily good, but, uh, but I think that change may well happen uh, substantially. But my sense is, is that uh, the, the place to look is at the creative side of things. I, I think this this may be already generating quite powerful creative movements, uh, whether artistic or philosophical or scientific. Um, I think in science that that growing sense of the different areas converging, having more dialogue between one focus of science with other fo foci of science. I think that that is becoming more apparent. So in that sense, the broadly speaking, the, the way we are with relation uh, and the way we give expression to relation, I think those are the things to look out for. That's my guess. What's yours? <clears throat> um. I'm only in the second week, <clears throat> so it's less informed. Uh, I would say on the social level, my anticipation stroke fear stroke hope <laughs> is um, that I suspect that there will be a move to try to normalize things. Yeah a top-down move to normalize things, and it'll be met with a bottom-up move, partly to normalize things, but also partly to say, hold on a minute, so there is a magic money tree. Yeah. You found all of this money. Yeah. You found ways of supporting people that you said were not possible. <clears throat> and I think that maybe there will be a move to keep alive possibilities that had previously been totally off the table. And I don't know if that's like a uh, guaranteed annual income or something. I think there will be some fundamental questions yeah. that previously were too radical and aren't anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I think there'll be a struggle for those. They won't just automatically emerge yeah. on the one hand and on the more relational and personal level, my hope for myself and also for others, but partly because it's what I want, is that this, um, that I will go back to <clears throat> what will emerge as my new work routines, because there will be some kind of routine. There already is a, that new kind of routine. Um, but I will go back to them with some uh, more, with a more inclusive sense of my being. Yeah. With those routines not leaving out so much of me as they did previously. Yeah. Yeah. 
I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> okay. All righty. So, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, what do you have a sense of what we've just been doing? Um, I think we. I feel like it was conversational. It was a dialogue, and it touched on things that were uh, bubbling away that hadn't come into words for me yet. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, much the same. I I, I think. Um, um, I think my hope is is that it was uh, accessible. You know, that we, you know, it, it didn't turn into something that was just for whatever specialists of one sort or another. Yeah. That what we were saying was understandable and that people could connect to it, even even if the connection is about disagreeing, that doesn't matter. Yeah. But that it was. Uh, you know, it it felt something that that was um, an honest communication. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess a kind of heartfelt communication. Yeah. yeah. I hope if it touches people, that yeah, that would be worthwhile. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great.